Welcome to Music Crush, a new music podcast hosted by the Flute New Music Consortium. I'm Nicole Reiner. And I'm Elizabeth Robinson. And announcing FNMC Presents, an album of previous commissions and competition winners performed by members of the Flute New Music Consortium. Repertoire includes works by Sean O'Pevolo, Joseph Hallman, Becca Sims, Cherie Slider, and others. Purchase a copy today. All proceeds go directly to FNMC. Flute New Music Consortium, Inc. is a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Your contributions are tax deductible to the extent allowed by the law. Visit www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com for details. Jane Kay is a composer, pianist, and educator. She composes in various styles, tastefully blending genres from classical to jazz and tango. In 2020, she released a jazz tango album, Tango Avenue, with her original works. And in 2022, she released an album of her art songs called Lift Up Your Hearts. Jane holds two master's degrees in music composition and music performance from Western Michigan University. She is currently working on a PhD in music composition at the University of Florida. Jane, welcome to Music Crush. Thank you. How's grad school going? What are you working on? All right, so I just finished the second year of my PhD in composition. So far, it's it's going great. I really love the program that I am in. I am at the University of Florida, um, and I'm really happy with the professors here, really happy with the projects I'm working on, and we have a lot of um, ensembles that uh, I have an opportunity to write for. So it, it's been great so far, honestly. Um, Next year, I will have still some coursework, but after that, I should be just diving in the dissertation writing, which I am excited about. Do you know what your dissertation is going to be about? Uh, kind of. I know that it is going to be focused on uh, text citing because I am very into um, writing vocal music, and I know that... Um, as a text nerd, I want to explore more and uh, it will be some analysis as well as some music writing. Um, you, you, you're you from the Czech Republic. Not quite. I'm from oh, Russia. Really? <laughs> yes. Oh, I'm okay. From Russia. <laughs> and did you, where did I come up with Czech Republic? Did you study there at all? Uh, no, you might be thinking because I had uh, one work of mine published in Czech Republic. I don't oh. know if, if that's mine. <laughs> yeah, that could be. That could be. Yeah. So how did you find your way to the U.S.? Can you take us through your your travel history, how you how you got to Michigan and then on to Florida? Yes. Although before Michigan, I applied to Berkeley way ago, like mm. it was in 2011. Um, I auditioned uh, for Berkeley and that was actually in Barcelona. So I had to travel to Barcelona from Yekaterinburg, which is um, uh, in the Ural Mountains in Russia. So it's right on the border of Europe and Asia. So I had to take a, two flights, I think, to Barcelona. Um, I auditioned, I passed the, audition, uh, the auditions and then I just didn't get the funding. So I mm, couldn't make yeah. it that time. And then it took me quite a while to figure out how I'm going to make it to the United States because I wanted to study jazz mm. and United States seemed to be a perfect place to do that. Um, so in 2017, I got the Fulbright scholarship and that is what allowed me to come to the States initially. Um, and that was for jazz composition. Um, and since uh, it was on Fulbright, actually, they um, selected the program that they wanted me to be in. So they selected the university. I had a list of universities, but they didn't select anything from that list. Oh, <laughs> so wow. they, But then they, they selected the university that I think was very good fit for me because uh, well, other than it was in Michigan, it was cold there. <laughs> <laughs> the program was fantastic. And although they didn't have jazz composition at the time, they allowed me to take anything I want from composition program, anything that I want from jazz program. Mm -hmm. And I made it work. And actually after me, I think at least a couple of more people did that blend of jazz composition. 
thing. Oh, you're a so. trailblazer. <laughs> yeah. And so then I did another master's degree there um, in just performance. And after that, I got into Florida in doing my PhD. And now you're warmer. Much. Yes. I, I consistently increasing, improving the weather conditions that I'm in. So Michigan okay. was much war warmer compared to the city that I grew up in. Sure. But yeah, Florida is definitely the best place so far. Oh, well, somebody's got to like it. So I'm glad you're enjoying it. <laughs> yes. Better you than me. <laughs> um, you also started out studying information technologies in college, I saw in your bio. Correct, yes. How did that course of study help inform the way that you work today as a composer and as a musician? I wouldn't say that it helped much. So what happened was that my parents were against me doing a music career. Oh, classic. And when I, yes, I know, when I finished high school, they wanted me to get into something practical, you know, mm -hmm. some normal job, normal education. Um, and I spent five years and I completed that degree, um, but um, at least in 2007, that's the time that were, um, I started um, kind of escaping into music more and more and more until I realized, okay, it's done. <laughs> I completed that degree. I worked in the office for like several months mm -hmm. and I don't want anymore to waste my life doing the thing that I don't like to do. I mean, not that I oppose information, uh, information technologies or anything. And I still use that. It's just that I want to focus more on music and I want to dedicate my life to that. So yeah, it was more of just being persistent and mm, sometimes go... <laughs> against my parents will yeah <laughs> um were you able to start working as a musician in russia or did that really take off once you got to the states uh, no actually while i was still uh, doing that degree in information technologies what happened was that my um the person that i studied guitar with because in addition to piano, I play a little bit guitar. Um, I mean, I am proficient enough to accompany myself, but I don't call myself a guitar player per se. So she wanted me to just get some help for her because she, uh, she had a studio and she trained uh, teenagers, just again, some basic accompaniment um, and singing with them. So she wanted to help her and I uh, was the one but then I had to get a some sort of music education mm -hmm. to be able to technically like being there working. Right. So it was a very long way. <laughs> so I had to take first the courses in, in what you would probably call here a vocational college. So it's something more um, down to the earth so it's not like in academia that you take a lot of courses that are not related to your field <laughs> but you're just really focusing on whatever field you are doing so I did it in education there I actually don't really put it on my CV because in America that college doesn't even qualify for because it doesn't give you any bachelor's degree or anything mm -hmm. it but it allowed me to work uh, to teach guitar at the time and then after I finished my informatic technologies degree I had to actually start over and do a full like bachelor's degree from scratch in music and so yeah I'm an eternal student I guess <laughs> <laughs> but yeah I managed to work uh, even when I I did uh, when, when I studied in Russia I worked at a, at one time. I worked like at five different jobs, and it oh, was wow. crazy. And I don't know how I did that, but yes, I did that. Wow. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a nice segue into my next question. You know, I mean, as you're as you're describing all of these different things that you just sort of said yes to, and just kind of see where they go. Mm -hmm. um, you seem to resist rigid 
genre labels like jazz or classical. I mean, you're talking Mm -hmm. about this, but also you're talking about the importance of fusing these styles in your work. Do you think that you're unique in this regard? Um, Do you feel like you're part of part of a, a group of composers who are trying to sort of blur these formerly rigid genre lines? Uh, so I don't think I'm unique in this regard. Uh, I don't know if there is a movement, <laughs> but I definitely found similar souls who also don't don't accept those boundaries. Um, and it's funny because I was interviewing um, a musician uh, named Kevin Jones, who is a percussionist, um, and he used to play with the Isley's brothers, Whitney Houston, like some big, really big names. Yeah. And he's a jazz musician. But then the music that he played is not jazz. And it, what he says is that we create those labels um, to sell the music, right? So we're called, okay, this is jazz, this is hip hop, this is reggae, this is something else. But music is more like a spectrum. And at times you cannot tell if that's really one genre or the other. And I think it's totally fine to to borrow from different genres or different styles and just be open to whatever ways that you can express yourself with. So to me, it's just natural to take whatever I get from jazz, whatever I get from uh, Latin music, whatever I get from something else. And also knowing like the Russian background, I am still informed by that as well. Sure. So I guess I just embrace uh, that, um, what would you call, I don't know, like multi-genres thing, yeah. but for sure it could be challenging as well because it is much easier to be just a choral composer or just jazz composer or just you know doing one thing. Um, otherwise people, at times can get confused and they can get a sense that you're not an excerpt, uh, expert of, mm. in one particular thing. Right. Or at times it also could be an issue, uh, especially when you apply to, to, to doctor school, for, for instance. I had that problem because I wanted to find a program that would be, um, accept, uh, that would accept uh, people of different uh, background, I guess, or that that are doing multiple things. Mm-hmm. And so it took me a while to find a program that uh, would be fine with that. Uh, like I said, I think it's just labels that we create, but it doesn't really describe <laughs> the music. Or I don't know, it just created the, bi- the boundaries, but the music is more about being open to different things. Right. Omnivore. Nice. Mm-hmm. Um, you on your website have also expressed an interest in the subject of writer's block, which I find fascinating. And mm-hmm. on the website, you have a written invitation for people to reach out to you and share their experiences. Have you have you heard from anyone? Do you have any particularly interesting stories that you'd be willing to share? Um, I didn't hear from anyone through the website, but whenever I go somewhere. <laughs> Like whenever I have a workshop or something, I always bring that topic and I always ask people about that because it's it's pretty common actually. And what I had um, once I finished my bachelor's degree, uh, the second one, <laughs> the music one, mm-hmm. um, in 2015, um, also at the time I had my music band broke, <laughs> I guess, just went different parts, uh, different mm-hmm. paths. And so what happened is I just didn't have any reason to write music for. I didn't have a band. I didn't have um, a degree to work on, like to write something for. Um, And yeah, it just was two years that I didn't really write anything. And actually, even when I came to the States, I still had the blog at the beginning. Hmm. And I was afraid that I wouldn't be able to do my program because of that. (laughs) because <laughs> how can I be a composer if I have a blog and cannot write anything right. but luckily my professor um, his name is Matthew Fries um, 
he's an amazing jazz musician, but he also composes. So he just gave me some tools to, to work out out of that. And yeah, um, since then, I think I multiplied the power, the writing power that I used to have before. And uh, what I, what my professors keep saying me now is, well, Jane, slow down. <laughs> Oh, you're right that's too much. <laughs> that's a good problem to have, though. I, I know, right? But yeah, I I'm aware of, um, especially with professorship, that you can get into that state when you t- you teach too much and you cannot even have time for writing, and right. so that's a very common problem. And I hope that <laughs> I will not face it once I get into university career. Yeah, well, I mean, you're thinking about it now and talking to people, so maybe maybe that's the best inoculation against it. Yeah, and I mean, I already had it once, so I know how to work myself out of that, hopefully. Right. Do you like have we're any... talking about a nasty virus or something. <laughs> <laughs> Do you yeah. have any general tips that you could share for just sort of getting back to a creative place from mm-hmm. maybe a less creative one? Yeah, so what I found out, with, what my problem was, well, first of all, I'm a per- perfectionist, mm. and um, yeah, I just had to force myself to just let go and whatever I create be a- a- acceptable of that, even mm-hmm. if it seems at times that that's not a great music. <laughs> so whatever comes to me, uh, my my tool is just uh, like my my goal is just to write it down mm. in whatever shape I can. Um, and also something that I found in the book of, uh, gosh, can I think? Oh, Julia Cameron, The Artist's Way. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. It, it's a very famous book on, mm-hmm. and it particularly deals with the artist's blog as well. So um, I think what she says there, that you need to kind of imagine that your writing is coming not directly from you within, but there is some source outside. And you don't have to be re- like religious or think of that in any sacred way, but just imagine that there is like a well or something that some source that you just had to tune in for <laughs> and that it, it can give you however much you want to take from that. But then you have to be constantly reaching out for or like connect to it in some way. And you have to schedule a time every um, day, if possible, sure. that you will dedicate for that. Um, and if you're gonna do every day, well, schedule some days a week, and then don't wait for inspiration to come to you, mm-hmm. but just consistently come, you know, come to your table or whatever is your working place and write however much you can or like create however much you can and don't be judgmental about that because you will take care about that later you will edit this later or people can be judgmental about that but don't be too not strict about about that um, creative process cool Well, kind of in the vein of creative projects, uh, do you have any composition plans you were willing to share with us? You are talking to two flutists, so you know where we're most interested. (laughs) We want to hear about anything you're working on. Right. Uh, So right now I'm working on a piece um, that is uh, commissioned for the project uh, called uh, And Mind My African. Um, So it's called Akotrobo. And um, it's a project that um, that is that deals with African art music. And they selected ten composers for this project. Um, and our goal is create something that would be in the style of African art music. And it's been a challenge since I'm not African, since I have Russian background. Um, it's been a challenge to do the research for that, to to just get into that um, atmosphere, into that music. And I'm working on a piece for um, soprano 
soprano voice, um, flute, um, violin, and piano. Mm. And my idea is to use all of those instruments uh, in some percussive way. Mm. Because a lot of African music is heavily based on rhythm and uh, like that percussion vibe. So with piano, I'm doing some extended technique of like just tapping and clapping and what whatnot. <laughs> with voice, also using that in in percussive um, way. Uh, with flute, also having some extended techniques. So yeah, just a very new genre for me. <laughs> and like I said, it, it's been a challenge, a real challenge. So, but I'm I'm very excited about that project. Um, another project for summer that also deals, well, not with flute, but with wood wings. Mm. Um, Natalie Groom, I don't know if you know her through Whistling Hands, um, they do it. Um, so she commissioned something, uh, a piece for, for her trio, that is clarinet, uh, horn, and bassoon. Oh. And since the instrumentation is not very common, there is not much repertoire for that. So she wanted a piece for them to, to be performed um, next year. More on my list, but I don't want to go through all of that. It's just... Oh, we didn't we didn't warn you. But do you have a dream project that if, you know, any commission could magically land in your lap, it would be this? Uh, yeah, I, I want to do more orchestral work, mm. but also it's not something that I'm still very comfortable with. Uh, it's definitely a, a challenge for me as well to, to write orchestral music, but something that I am planning on not really dreaming but strategically trying to work my way into um i want to write a requiem um oh. for choir and either or like chamber orchestra maybe um so far i have written just one movement that i think will go into that requiem um so i, I did requiem eternum and it was performed uh, premiered in michigan uh this past weekend on Saturday uh, with Chalabris Ensemble uh, in Kalamazoo, Michigan, and uh, my dear friend Nigar Afazel, who plays flute, uh, sorry, violin. No, I got into flute mode. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, she plays violin. Um, she's now in Peabody Conservatory, but um, yeah, we had that opportunity to perform together. Well, congratulations on the premiere. Yeah, thank you. What language is the Requiem and the, the beginning of this Requiem? What what language did you choose? Um, so far, I'm going with Latin, but <laughs> I might incorporate some English texts. Um, so what I did for this past um, premiere is I actually picked that Requiem Maternum text and then as a second piece to be um, kind of as a diptych, if you prefer so just mm -hmm. two two pieces kind of on the same theme um i wrote a text uh called uh let them be found and um it was my reflection on uh, people who passed away very young um and in my family in particular uh there were at least two suicides uh unfortunately with my uh, cousin and then with my mother's cousin as well and so i wanted to create something to commemorate them and to um well create a kind of a prayer but not in a sacred way not in a religious way but just something that could be open to any people and yeah just trying to find those people who who pass very young in very common things like in, in memories that you have of them or in in something maybe in the nature that remind you of them or you know some just daily things because i think every person um leaves the trace in this world mm. so my text is kind of about that mm. That's Beautiful. Lovely. yeah well sometimes dark things <laughs> can lead to beautiful stories or pieces <laughs> Kind of in the vein of a mix of good and bad, um, we're always interested <laughs> in composers' opinions, good, bad, <laughs> ugly, or both, about yeah. uh, composition competitions. 
what are your thoughts? Oh, yes. Um, well, as Bella Bartik beautifully said, <laughs> competitions are for horses, not men. And I can agree on something with, with that quote. Um, but then I also think that uh, music is a very competitive field. And in particular, composition is very competitive field. And we are always compared to each other. And we always are judged, unfortunately or fortunately. So I think by participating in compositions, we get into that mode of just being fine with rejections, get, getting used to rejections. That is part of any music musician's life, I think. Um, it also sometimes even if you don't get to be in the winner, sometimes it can give, give you an opportunity. Sometimes someone could notice you through mm -hmm. the competition. Mm -hmm. And so maybe the opportunity couldn't come right away, but someone heard your piece and someone might like it. So your piece might be not placed on the top. Um, also, I think it's helpful to understand that if you're not placed on the top, that doesn't mean that your piece is bad, <laughs> per se. Sometimes it means that it doesn't fit the goals of the, um, however, the company who organizes the competition or um, any particular person who is the jury, who is the chair of the jury. Um, it can teach you how to pick the repertoire <laughs> that you mm. submit somewhere. It can for sure teach you a lot of things. And on the plus side, if you write something for a competition, like say it, 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 it requires a new piece for that. Well, you have a deadline and at least you will have a finished project. <laughs> so even if your piece is not going to be selected, you will have a project done and you can submit it for something else. You can find another performance for that. Um, and yeah, I think there are a lot of great things about that. About ugly things, um, unfortunately, a lot of competitions require the fee. Mm. And um, I can accept when it requires small fee. I don't really get when uh, the competition requires uh, a huge fee and then it doesn't really give a prize for that mm. <laughs> or like uh, the the price is so small that you're questioning well where is that money going to sure because <laughs> yeah. i understand that they need to hire their juries they need to pay or it, even if that's non-profit they they probably still have to handle some some things um with that competition but i think the priority should be on the composers and new music but not only just making um uh, not making out of that a scheme to to making money i guess sure so you said something about um learning more about how to match repertoire to the opportunity are you able to talk a little bit more about that right well i think once you get into submission to publishers, <laughs> that is where you really have to dig what the publisher is looking for. Sure. Because again, it might be nothing wrong with your piece. Um, it might be just not a good fit for the publisher. Um, and I'm just at the beginning of that <laughs> journey, to be honest. I have some publications with traditional publishers. So I had a um, couple of pieces already published with C. Allen publications. Mm. Um, there are two more that is still in progress, so they were accepted, but they're not published yet because it takes a long, really long time. Um, and then I had two choral pieces that were published with Peer Music. Um, I have another choral piece that was published with Santa Barbara Music Publishing. Um, that I uh, I co-wrote this piece with my friend Joel Snyder uh, from Michigan, <laughs> from Kalamazoo, Michigan, that I really just came from <laughs> two days ago. Um, and so, so far, I can say that the rejections that I had 
um, usually had to do something with just the piece not fitting the catalog. Sure. And so that I had to dig more into what the publisher is looking for. And then not saying that I had to write something in that style or in, in that genre, but just be aware of that and maybe search for another publisher that would be more interested in, in the music that I'm writing. That makes sense. Yeah, that's great advice. You alluded to a future life in academia, perhaps. What are what are your hopes and dreams <laughs> after you finish your PhD? And do you know where you want to end up or are you just kind of open-ended? So far, very open-ended, mostly because of my visa status and right. because of the political situation in the world that I cannot control. Yeah. Um, I don't honestly know if I would be able to stay in the States after I graduate. I hope I will, um, because I think um, that's a good fit for me and I hope I am a good fit <laughs> for this country as well. Um, at least as a composer, I think um, JNK exists in Russia. <laughs> uh, no, in, in the States, it doesn't really exist in Russia in, in the way that it exists here. Mm -hmm. um, so I would say that my career as a composer very heavily focused in the States right now. I still have connections in Russia and I still, um, so for instance, I write music for a theater project in, in Russia, in my hometown. Um, but I would say that the majority of the commissions, the majority of the projects I'm working on are all based in the States. So I will make everything possible. Uh, just to stay here and be able to create more here. Um, as far as career goes, I think my dream career would be most mostly composition, mostly being a composer, and then to some extent being an educator. That is still a big part of, sure. um, I guess, my identity. And I want to share my knowledge with others. I want to share my experience. I want to support others. Um, but what I don't want to get into, and again, I, I just witnessed so many examples like that, is where professors who teach composition, unfortunately, don't compose as much anymore sure. because of how how much uh, their teaching load is, because of sometimes of burned out, being burned out and not being able to compose. So I hope I will be able to balance uh, to find a balance between you know creative life to, to being a composer an active composer and hopefully making David living out of that and then having an academia teaching career just being balanced with that because yeah. uh, to me being a student uh, right now and learning from from composition faculty i think it's important to me that uh, my mentor should be active. Well, if you figure it out, I think you could you could probably sell the book for a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> keep that balance. Yes, yes, <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> yeah, but other than that, there are so many creative projects that <laughs> that I need to work on, and you know that Hydra myth <laughs> that you got one. <laughs> Uh, one yeah. head and there there are more <laughs> <laughs> so far it feels like that there is one project that I complete but there are much more uh, there are many more that that I need to work on so I hope I will not get a burnout <laughs> yeah well it sounds like I mean if you're if, if you're just filled with ideas it sounds like you're you're living an inspired life definitely and um, I know I mentioned before that composition is a very competitive field, but also what I found is, oh, music overall is a very competitive field. What I found is that uh, I like working in collaborations with other people. Mm. So I like doing some collaborations with the lyricists. So I like writing contemporary, um, uncontemporary poetry. Um, I like to do something with dance department here at the UF and we have done a project uh, this past um, year and we're going to have another project with them next year. Um, so I like to do 
film scoring. Mm. So I like to be inspired by different things and I like to work in in the team as well. Well, speaking of inspiration, um, we usually end our interviews with the question, what are three things you're currently listening to now? Yes, I'm kind of a weird person <laughs> in when it comes to music listening, uh, because due to my profession, <laughs> due to my composition, uh, uh, being a composer, I have to listen to a lot of music that deals with the current project I'm working on. Sure. So if I write a project for bassoon, I listen to everything possible that people can recommend me that deals with bassoon writing. Yeah. <laughs> or like percussion, then I focus heavily on percussion. Um, so at the moment, I obviously is focused on African art music, so I listen a lot to that. Uh, but when it comes to more just listening, uh, I guess not active listening, but more passive listen, uh, mm -hmm. say while we have a dinner or something. So my husband is usually <laughs> kind of a DJ for us. <laughs> so he usually the one who picks the, the music that we are listening to. So yesterday we have Diana Kroll oh. and we had, what else did we have? So on the way from Michigan, we listened to an album by Sting. Ooh. So I like Sting a lot. Okay. Um, and then Nora Jones as well. So oh. I like some mm -hmm. good songs, some, some good songwriters. This is a dinner party vibe. Yeah. <laughs> yes. <laughs> do you have, do you have, it's okay if you don't, but do you have a specific song from any of these three artists that you would particularly recommend to listeners? Gosh, yeah, a lot. <laughs> <laughs> well, with Sting, uh, my favorite is Shape of My Heart, of oh, Shape of Your Heart, Shape of Someone's Heart, <laughs> and then <laughs> I guess Fragile, how, how Fragile We Are, mm. that one is also my favorite. Um, trying to think what is with Nora Jones. Um, I think the title is Come Away With Me. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So I like that one. That's a yeah, and then with Diana Kroll, no, I cannot pick one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I like Diana Kroll. It's a nice combination of voice and pianism. Awesome. You ever listen to Elvis Costello mm. since they're married? Uh, I, guess I think it's amazing much. how different they are. <laughs> not as much. <laughs> <laughs> no 70s post-punk for you, huh? Okay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Well, Jane, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so yep. much for having me. Good luck uh, finishing up the PhD. And we, we look forward to continuing to follow you online and see what you've been up to. Thank you for joining us for another episode of Music Crush. You can subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can also support the podcast, read show notes, and learn more about FNMC by visiting www.flutenewmusicconsortium.com.